If you like Academic Agents content on this channel, sign up for a course on the Academic Agency. He's now offering Foundations of Economics. Click the link in the show description and level up your econ knowledge. There's been this meme doing the rounds recently, as I'm sure everybody watching this knows, the person getting slapped here is Tim Pool. But the person doing the slapping, as some of you will know, but many of others you will not, is the political theorist Carl Schmidt. And I thought this would be a good opportunity to use uh, Carl Schmidt's ideas about uh, politics to approach, again, the events that we saw uh, last year in the US election. Because I think Schmidt gives us a lens through which to understand really what has happened. Those of you who watched my videos last week will already be familiar with the friend-enemy distinction for which Schmidt is famous because I mentioned it uh, in the third of my videos uh, about libertarianism and why their arguments fail against socialists. Schmidt uh, outlines that there are very different domains the domain of aesthetics, for example, work functions on the dichotomy between beauty and ugliness, morality between good and evil, economics between utility and disutility. But politics is quite a separate sphere, and that functions on the distinction between friend and enemy. Now, the friend-enemy distinction is not just some polite disagreement. It is an existential conflict. Friend and enemy are concrete realities. An enemy is not a competitor or an opponent or somebody that you hate personally, but what the Greeks called a hostess, a public enemy. If the friend-enemy distinction runs deep enough, all non-political groupings become quote-unquote political, including the legal sphere, the social sphere, the religious sphere, and indeed the economic sphere. If a political disjunction exists in a state so deep, the state itself ceases to exist and rather becomes two states in one, because all states must keep a monopoly of political decision to maintain inner peace. For a state to remain the state, it must exclude the friend-enemy distinction internally by keeping disagreements quote-unquote limited. Truly political conflict is unlimited and total. And I have this image here of David Cameron, Nick Clegg and Gordon Brown from the 2010 election because this illustrates quite well the limited sphere of disagreement that the state can brook. Uh, ultimately, David Cameron, Nick Clegg and Gordon Brown are three flavours of the same basic ice cream. They might disagree on, you know, exactly where the tax rate should be or exactly when to implement something like gay marriage, but fundamentally they're all in agreement that there should be a tax rate or that gay marriage should be legalized. So the disagreements between them are very limited in scope. They are not an existential conflict as the conflict in the United States has been between Donald Trump and the neoliberal system. If a limited disagreement becomes a truly political conflict, and the leaders of the state do not put it down, then the state is gone. The nature and essence of the state is inner peace and outer struggle. Uh, picture the, the monk here, he has peace within himself so he can focus on external enemies. Now where this gets interesting is in something called Schmidt's Law of Serenity. Uh, Schmidt was famous for saying, sovereign is he who decides on the exception. We have this concept of law being this objective standard that is applied equally to all. But of course, the sovereign, the king in any given system, can act 
arbitrarily and can make exceptions uh, to uh, the law. As soon as you start making exceptions to the law, that uh, ideal principle of equality before the law is, of course, compromised. And this compromise with the uh, strict principle of law is in the nature of sovereignty and power. If an internal disagreement becomes a political conflict, the sovereign power must intervene before a critical juncture is passed. And I've pictured um, Charles I here because clearly Charles I did not act soon enough to avert the crisis that was coming. During the years of the Civil War, England ceased to exist as a political unit. Both parliamentarians and monarchists considered themselves, quote-unquote, the government. In parliamentary-run spaces, monarchists were not only enemy, but actually illegal, and vice versa. If you were a parliamentarian in a monarchist-run area, you were effectively an outlaw. From the English Civil War, we can see that law is downstream from politics. Law has the function of consolidating a given political fact complex and I've pictured the Nuremberg trials here because it's a very good example of how law simply consolidates uh, the power of the victors. In such a scenario the victor is and was always legally right all the time and the defeated is and was always legally wrong. This fact shows the true nature of law, that law is downstream of politics and is ultimately decided by the sovereign who can make the exception. And this is where I think we can use uh, the Schmittian lens to make sense of what happened in the United States last year. Consider, as long as the neoliberal reign in the USA, Trump and his supporters will be considered not only enemy, but also illegal. Their claims are illegal. Their actions are illegal. Now, if Trump were ever to get back into power and to replace the neoliberal state, including the judiciary with a Trumpian apparatus, a truly uh, Trumpian state, then we would find the inverse. The claims of the neoliberals would not simply be wrong, but also illegal. We would have an exact inverse of what we're seeing now. Uh, the judiciary would find that the Democrats cheated and the Trumpian version of events would be enshrined into law. Now, the fact that Trump is still at large means that we are still in a situation akin to England in 1639 pre-Civil War. We still have two groups in the USA, each defining the other as enemy, in, in the truly political sense, in the Schmittian sense, and legislating against each other. True victory comes only with the right to determine the inner enemy. That's the inner enemy within the state. Democrats define the inner enemy as white supremacists who follow Trump, and these are designated domestic terrorists. Trumpians define the inner enemy as Antifa or communists, who start inner city riots. And these are also designated as domestic terrorists by the Trumpian side. Now, as I mentioned, if Charles I had declared an inner enemy sooner, the Civil War would probably be averted. Now, Donald Trump did declare an inner enemy. Remember, he constantly said that the media is the enemy of the American people. However, Donald Trump never truly gained control of the state apparatus. He was always an insider, and so he was never really in power. He just kept the seat warm in the White House for four years without any real functional power. And you can see from this article from factcheck.org, Trump can't designate Antifa or any movement a domestic terrorist organization, says Laurie Robertson on June the 1st, 2020. Now, it just so happens that the next president, Joe Biden, who, by contrast to Trump, has control of the state apparatus, and he has also named an inner enemy. 
uh, he decried the Trump mob. He said, don't call them protesters. They were domestic terrorists. Now, factcheck.org did not run pieces saying that Biden can't designate Trump supporters as domestic terrorist organization. You will not see the media push back on Biden in the same way because, of course, they're on his side, as is the law, because Biden represents the regime who have been in power for many years, the status quo, and Trump is an insurgent. Trump is the equivalent of the uh, parliamentarians uh, in the English Civil War. The problem the Democrats have, however, is, uh, is manifold. First, Antifa and the media are both tiny minority groups, and it's hard to say just how many people in America agree with them. Uh, you know, supposedly 84 million people agree with them. However, there are good reasons to be skeptical of that number, I would suggest. Uh, second, Trump's support base is a huge group, and this is a demonstrable fact. Potentially over 70 million people, and most, including those in control of state legislatures, especially in places like Arizona and Florida, see uh, the Democrats as enemy in the true sense of the word. This is a problem because just like in um, Civil War England, you have uh, the state, this is Biden's uh, state, has areas of the USA controlled by the inner enemy. What do you do here? Third, the Biden administration is still almost entirely in the shadow of Trump and defined nearly exclusively by its opposition to Trump, which serves paradoxically to strengthen him. Again, I would go back to the Charles the um, First uh, analogy. It would be very weak if Charles the First defined himself almost entirely in opposition to the parliamentarians rather than uh, doubling down on his divine right of kings and talking about uh, the legitimacy of the true king. Um, that's rather different from constantly uh, talking about his political opponents. And fourth, a ruthless crackdown of the inner enemy of the sort which is necessary to consolidate their power may provoke an open conflict, in which case it is already too late. I mean, don't get me wrong, from the Democrat point of view and from Biden's point of view, um, this is not a mere election win. He needs to pretty much hunt down the inner enemy and crack down on them um, if they are going to consolidate their power. And it's interesting to think about what's going to happen, because I imagine that uh, in many parts of America, they're going to meet pr pretty strong resistance to any attempt to crack down, which may mean that Biden is in the Charles the first position where it's too late to swing back the momentum for what, from what has happened, and that the Trumpians are like the parliamentarians in um, the late 16. Uh, 30s or the early uh, 1640s um, that there is going to be a change coming. Now for my part as you know I have already mentioned that I withdraw all support from Trump because I thought the moment to act uh, was last year. Uh, he showed he was not a great man and I will stand by my decision that I will not back any further runs or 2024 or anything you know I am no longer um, going to give any support to that. Uh, movement. But that is not to say that the reality on the ground in America changes because of who I'm uh, supporting. So it will be interesting uh, for us to follow this situation, given that uh, I think the situation in America has become truly uh, Schmittian. You know, it's it's got this, you've got the inner enemy within the state. Dep and depending on which side of the aisle you're on, the inner enemy is either uh, you know, neoliberals, uh, the media, the enemy of the people, you know, or it's the Trumpians who are quite literally the enemy of the state. However, my purpose in making this video was not just uh, as an opportunity to do a, you know, rank bit of punditry, 
but also to point out the, the much uh, wider implication of Schmidt's points here, which is that uh, law is downstream of politics. This notion of the law being this fair thing that is applied equally to all people is another utopian liberal assumption about the world that has never been true. Law is almost always Victor's bragging rights when it comes to politics. The law will uphold a political status quo come what may. I'm not saying that the judicial system and that the legal system in England or in America is fundamentally unfair when it comes to most cases, you know, when it comes to criminal cases or your common garden trial. But when it comes to politics, when it comes to matters concerning the quote-unquote inner enemy, that's where you'll see the true nature of law reveal itself as yet another conduit of political power and of sovereignty. All right, I think that's enough to chew on for today. Now available at the Academic Agency. Sharpen your analytical mind and your argumentation skills with Foundations of Logic. The course draws on the ancient wisdom of traditional logic that students learned for over 2,000 years, from the time of Aristotle through to the medieval schoolmen right down to the 20th century. Sign up now for a free preview lecture. Be sure to like this video and subscribe. And if you really like my content, maybe consider joining the channel or donating or maybe even buy a mug. I am grateful for all of your support. Now get out.